They are the holy grail of all Hollywood memorabilia. Judy Garland's ruby slippers from The Wizard of Oz, a national treasure worth millions. But once they were thought to be so insignificant, they were destined for the trash. Journey into a peculiar Hollywood underworld and find out what really happened to Judy Garland's ruby slippers. A Hollywood mystery story, next on Treasure. These are the most recognizable shoes in all Hollywood history. They need no explanation. Everyone knows what they are, who wore them, what they mean. They are the indelible icon of a uniquely American fairy tale, an enduring symbol of the power of belief. They are also worth a fortune, which is power in itself. But even more, they are objects of obsession. The Wicked Witch of the West was certainly obsessed by them and possessed by the promise of their power. But the charm and magic of Dorothy's shoes goes far beyond the pages of a book or the scenes of a movie. They have assumed a power of their own that is very real. The fabled shoes are important enough to be on perpetual display at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Every year, upwards of five million people visit the national treasure. We don't clock individual numbers here, but I can tell you that um, whenever we've had to take the shoes off for any reason whatsoever, we get irate phone calls, disappointed little girls from all over the country come to see these things. They are without a doubt one of the most popular items on display here. Visitors are inexplicably drawn to the shoes that carried lost Dorothy along the yellow brick road in search of the fearsome wizard. He would help her get home to Kansas. I recently got a letter from a little girl who asked me if the shoes still work. And I wrote her back and I said, well, if you mean do, do we wear the shoes still? No, we don't because they're fragile and they could fall apart. But if you're asking, are they still magic? I said, well, the magic's always in you. They're magic if you believe. First, you have to believe that they're really Judy Garland's ruby slippers. The museum knows they are from the movie, but they don't know whether Judy Garland ever put her feet in this well-worn pair of shoes. The Smithsonian's dilemma is part of a confounding mystery about what really happened to the ruby slippers from MGM's 1939 classic, The Wizard of Oz. Since May 1970, this question has preoccupied countless people who have followed the story from studio back lots and prop houses into a peculiar underworld where the best pieces of Hollywood memorabilia were once up for grabs. What is known is that the Smithsonian's ruby slippers are authentic, but they are not the only pair in existence. And how could this be? Well, the land of Oz is a very different place than the land of Hollywood. In the land of Oz, there was just one pair of magic shoes. But in Hollywood, as a rule, we had two costumes made. When we did a dance number, there was always two costumes made. The reason was simple to any Hollywood insider. If an important costume was damaged during production, they couldn't stop filming until a new costume was made. They had to have extras. Such was the case with Judy Garland's ruby slippers. 
They always had a pair immediately ready to go. It wasn't like, oh, well, let's go make a new pair now. No, they made them way ahead of time. What's more, Judy Garland had a stand-in who also wore the ruby slippers. So how many different pairs did they have? Debbie Reynolds says there were five pairs. Or were there six, as this newspaper headline suggests? Then again, consider this number written inside this authentic ruby slipper. Seven pairs, maybe? All the costume records for The Wizard of Oz were thrown away, so nobody knows for sure how many were actually made. The answer might not seem so important if they weren't worth so much money. Today, the ruby slippers are considered the holy grail of all Hollywood memorabilia, with an estimated value topping a million dollars per pair. So how many pairs actually exist? To find out, one must journey back through time to the epic year when the ruby slippers were made. One of Hollywood's great ironies is the very existence of the ruby slippers. Originally, they weren't that color. In L. Frank Baum's book, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, published in 1900, Dorothy's magic shoes were made of precious metal, silver. In Baum's book, one of the munchkins tells Dorothy, the witch of the East was proud of those silver shoes, and there is some charm connected with them, but what it is, we never knew. We never knew either, because the silver shoes were never seen on the silver screen. The Wizard of Oz was big in every Hollywood sense of the word. Louis B. Mayer spent $3 million to produce a movie using Kodak's new Technicolor film. He wasn't going to settle for black and white shoes. In 1938, MGM assigned a studio scriptwriter named Noel Langley to adapt the children's story to the screen. Langley faced many challenges in the work, including what to do about the color of Dorothy's shoes. Sometime between May 14th and June 4th of 1938, the first and last recorded revisions made on this Oz script, a Hollywood decision was made. Page 26, scene number 113. When Glinda the Good Witch of the North waves her wand and the shoes belonging to the recently squished Wicked Witch of the East magically appear on the feet of unsuspecting Dorothy. Here, the typed word silver was scratched out and ruby written in. By the stroke of the screenwriter's hand, Dorothy Gale's silver shoes became Judy Garland's ruby slippers. What the screenwriter didn't know was that the shoes he created would assume a unique and powerful charm of their own. Everyone knows what the ruby slippers are, but few people know what they actually look like. When MGM celebrated the 50th anniversary of the movie in 1989, the Franklin Mint created an authorized Dorothy doll, said to be completely authentic, right down to the ruby slippers. Unfortunately, they forgot the bows. But coincidentally, the first design for the ruby slippers didn't have bows either. MGM production number 1060 began in the summer of 1938, among many who worked on the film was Gilbert Adrian. Known best by his surname, Adrian was one of the world's premier fashion designers in the 1930s. Like other great artists, he came to Hollywood during the Depression. At MGM, he designed some of the most famous gowns in movie history. For The Wizard of Oz, Adrian created hundreds of magnificent costumes, including those for the Munchkins. These took most of his time. Almost incidental were the ruby slippers, which actually evolved from one design to another. Several different looks were tested. The initial design had no bows. They were used in the first round of filming when Richard Thorpe was directing. Then in October 1938, Thorpe was fired. Victor Fleming replaced him, and they started over. Among many changes, Dorothy got a makeover, including a new hairdo and a new style of magic shoes. Given the extra time, Adrian designed a wild-looking pair of slippers, almost elfish, curling at the heel and toe. They came to be known as the Arabian Test Pair. They truly are unique 
with the toe coming up and the little flap. A little low heel. These are my favorites. I, I know that Judy wore them. I know that she liked them best of all, by the way. She said, I want the ones with the pointed toe. But the Arabian pair looked strange on plain Dorothy's feet. So Adrian simply added jeweled bows to the first style. This became the final ruby slipper design. And doubles were ordered for Judy Garland and her stand-in. The foundation was a basic French heeled pump purchased from the Innes Shoe Company in Hollywood, California. The sequined overlays and bows were made at MGM. Each overlay had 2,300 sequins, and each bow had dozens of rhinestones and bugle beads. In 1938, they cost about $13 a pair. During production, orange felt was added to the soles of the shoes to muffle the noise made during the dance numbers. This was because MGM's yellow brick road was actually made of plywood. Only one pair was kept without the felt, the pair used for close-up shots. In time, this would become an important distinction to collectors. When production finished, the shoes, along with all the other unique costumes, were packed up and put in MGM's form of deep storage. For all practical purposes, they were put away for 30 years, left to rot. Nobody at MGM knew or cared. And so began the legend of the missing ruby slippers. Treasure will continue in a moment here on A&E. We now return to Treasure here on A&E. Nineteen seventy was a peculiar year in Hollywood history. The original movie moguls were fading from the scene, being replaced by men from Wall Street. At Metro Goldwyn Mayer, it wasn't just a corporate takeover; it was a raid. That year, the entire studio was sold to a reclusive financier named Kirk Kerkorian. He immediately cashed out selling studio property to finance a new casino in Las Vegas. The wholesale liquidation was highlighted by a lucrative land sale, which included MGM's storied back lots, studio lots two, three, four, and five. The land was worth a fortune, but the contents of the land, the physical property stored on the back lots, was seriously undervalued. This was MGM's closet, to Louis B. Mayer, it was the world's largest movie-making warehouse, a veritable treasure chest of antiques, artwork, machinery, and costumes. But to Wall Street, it was nothing but a burden of storage and maintenance. It was junk. Kerkorian could have kept some of the historic memorabilia to display in his casino, but instead, he sold everything to an auctioneer named David White for a mere $1.5 million. A single pair of ruby slippers is worth that today. David Weiss bought an unbelievable assortment of Hollywood treasures, from Ben-Hur's chariots and the HMS Bounty, to Clark Gable's coats and Greta Garbo's gowns. There were cars, trains, airplanes, tanks, and the full-sized paddle wheeler from Showboat. Costumes alone filled seven buildings, over 350,000 separate items. The auctioneer was overwhelmed by the sheer volume of material, but he recognized the celebrity value connected to some of the items. So he decided to hold a glamorous, well-publicized star auction. Afterwards, he presided over the largest and saddest garage sale Hollywood has ever known. He was so sad and it was so so ridiculous and so narrow-minded and just stupid is the word. And I've never forgotten it and I've never gotten over it and the enemy was still angry about it. The MGM auction of May 1970 was like an 18-day wait for Hollywood. I sobbed every day uncontrollably. I was like this having a breakdown person. People just would look and go, well, what is the matter with her? The auction officially began on May 1st 
and culminated with the Star Wardrobe Sale on May 17th. It was a magnificent production in itself. Debbie Reynolds was there for every minute of it, checkbook in hand. Her goal was to preserve as much of Hollywood's history as she could before the studio threw it all away. I was every day at auction for three to four weeks, as long as it went. I wasn't into buying the rose bushes and uh, all of the, the, the lamp posts, and I couldn't really buy the airplanes. I did buy cars, and I did buy sets, which means the furniture from a picture and the costumes, so I could recreate a famous scene from every famous motion picture that had won an Academy Award from MGM. Reynolds spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to save countless Hollywood treasures. But strangely, she didn't bid a dime for the ruby slippers. In truth, nobody expected much action from the frumpy pair of sequin shoes. But when the gavel came down at $15,000, they became the most valuable memorabilia in Hollywood history. Imagine the surprise of Roberta Bauman, a Memphis housewife, on Monday morning, May 18, 1970. There she was, reading the newspaper in her kitchen, when a story from Culver City, California, caught her eye. I said, looky here. One pair of shoes brought $15,000 out in uh, Culver City. The story said the shoes had been auctioned by MGM the day before. Roberta was surprised because she had the ruby slippers in her closet and thought they were the only pair. Within hours, Roberta's story and photograph hit the news wires. There she was, holding her pair of ruby slippers. Suddenly, the press had a mystery to solve. Roberta said she had won them in a movie contest, and she had proof to back it up. In high school, she had belonged to a club, the Photo Play Club, that watched and reviewed movies. The year was 1939, Hollywood's epic year. Roberta was a junior. That winter, members of the Photo Play Club entered a contest. Metro Goldwyn Mayor had a promotion, and we were told to send a postcard to New York to vote on the 10 best pictures of 1939. Roberta voted Gone with the Wind, number one. She can't recall where she placed The Wizard of Oz. Her picks were good enough to win second place in the contest. And her prize? The ruby red slippers. The size 6B shoes were presented to her in the spring of 1940. She was 16 years old, Dorothy's age. For 30 years, Roberta believed she had the only pair of ruby slippers. I had no idea, and I didn't at that time know how many pairs were out there. Between 1940 and 1970, Roberta enjoyed sharing her pair of magic shoes with the public. But news of the MGM auction changed everything. For Roberta, it was the first of many gigantic twists along her own yellow brick road. At first, she thought one of the pairs had to be fakes, and she worried that the fakes might be hers. Fearing the worst, she called her old high school teacher, Miss Josephine Allensworth. I said, you know, Miss Josephine, we weren't told uh, anything about these shoes, and I don't know how many pairs are they, and what should I do? She said, challenge them. She said, go up to the newspaper and and tell, tell about it, how you received them in high school. And that's what I did. But the press found no answers. So she decided to contact MGM directly. I wrote a letter to Metro Golden Mayor in Culver City to ask them to confirm if I had an authentic pair of ruby slippers. Because I had told the little children in all the schools all the time I had them that I was told when I received them, when my teacher received them, they had been worn by Judy Garland. MGM refused Roberta's letter, marking the envelope returned to sender. 
But the studio could not ignore the controversy, so they referred it to David Weiss. The auctioneer was just as surprised as Mrs. Bauman. In a letter to the anonymous buyer, Weiss said there was only one pair of garland red shoes in the MGM inventory, but that was not the whole truth. Soon, what was common knowledge among Hollywood costumers became obvious to Roberta Bauman, David Weiss, and not insignificantly, the man who paid $15,000 at the MGM auction for what he thought were the only ruby slippers. After the sale, Debbie Reynolds quietly told people she didn't bid on the shoes because she believed they belonged to Judy Garland's stand-in. I tried them on, and I would have bid, but I knew they weren't the real pair, so why would I bid? What Reynolds didn't say was that she knew there were other pairs of ruby slippers, and she knew who had them. His name was Kent Warner, and he alone held the secret of the missing ruby slippers. Treasure will continue in a moment here on A&E. We now return to Treasure here on A&E. After the MGM auction and Roberta Bauman's revelation, the mystery of the ruby slippers began to grow. People began to wonder how many pairs actually existed. Only one man ever knew. His name was Kent Warner. He was a Hollywood costumer who was very bright and talented with a keen understanding of movie history. Like Debbie Reynolds, Kent Warner witnessed the wholesale trashing of Hollywood's most important costumes and props during the 1960s and 70s. He watched the big studios throw everything away, and he did something about it. His friends called him Lana Lip but he became better known as Hollywood's Robin Hood. Because of his clandestine actions, many Hollywood treasures were saved from destruction. Kent Warner came to Hollywood when he was 21 years old. He was a native of New York who loved movies and wanted to work in show business. His first job was with a Hollywood rental company that specialized in movie wardrobe. It was 1964. That summer, the rental house bought the RKO wardrobe collection. RKO, once home to Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, had been thoroughly trashed by various owners since the 1950s. By 64, its physical assets were in disarray. Warner was sent to RKO by his boss to see what was there. He was shocked. Some costumes were being used as kitchen rags. Others were rotting on their hangers. Beautiful garments, once worn by Hollywood's greatest stars, were falling apart. The rental house was only interested in wearable items. Throw away the rest, Warner was told. The tragic scene made Kent wonder, how could so much history, so many beautiful things, be treated so badly? Very quickly, he sized up the situation. The studios, all of them, were systematically trashing important Hollywood artifacts. He saw it being trashed. I saw it being trashed. I would drive every night off the lot, and they were burning film clips over in trash cans. They threw all the original music, all the scores, over the, when they were building the freeway. It's buried under the freeway. Kent Warner agonized about this. Things had to be saved, rescued, liberated. So instead of throwing away Ginger Rogers' famous gowns, he kept them for himself. But Kent Warner took his work one step further. Some clothes, like top hats, were reusable, but Warner didn't turn in the ones marked with the name Fred Astaire, and nobody missed them. Kent Warner understood the value of historic costumes. They were treasures worth good money. One thing led to another, and soon Kent Warner was quietly selling wardrobe out of the trunk of his car. It was risky, but lucrative and rewarding. Almost single-handedly, he created a thriving underground marketplace for historic Hollywood memorabilia. Between 1964 and 1972, Kent Warner worked this Robin Hood act at all the major studios. 
Because he was a costumer by trade, he regularly went to all the studio wardrobe departments and rental houses in town. He got to know all the people, even the gate guards. He could drive his car anywhere on any lot and carry off an armful or rack of costumes. He had carte blanche. He also had a connoisseur's eye. Warner recognized the important pieces and went for them. He sought out clothes worn by Rudolph Valentino, Marilyn Monroe, Clark Gable, Greta Garbo, and not just run-of-the-mill items, but key pieces, like Bogart's trench coats from Casablanca. He went for the best. Certain costumes had personal value to him, especially those worn by Judy Garland. Kent Warner idolized Judy Garland. In 1965, he attended the Academy Awards, and during the dinner, he mugged behind the Hollywood siren. More than anything, Kent Warner hoped that one day he might be able to find and rescue Judy Garland's ruby slippers. The day came in 1970 when Kent Warner hired on at MGM to help prepare the costume inventory for auction and liquidation. He worked there. He worked for free. They gave him costumes instead of money. They paid him a little bit of money and they let him pick what he wanted. He was just smart enough to work there. I would have worked there for free. Kent Warner became the genius behind the scenes at the MGM auction. He was more knowledgeable than anyone else, and he was driven in part by his desire to find and save the ruby slippers. Treasure will continue in a moment here on A&E. We now return to Treasure here on A&E. In the spring of 1970, Kent Warner quietly searched every inch of MGM for the ruby slippers. He had no idea what he might find. Finally, he came to a decrepit building where thousands of old costumes were stored. Somewhat precariously, he climbed into the loft. It was hot, smelly, and dark, he later told friends. Then a ray of sunlight picked up the glimmer of a sequin. I walked over. I didn't touch them. I blew the dust from them. The red and the sequins appeared, and I knew they were the ruby slippers. Warner found all of them, he thought, including the Arabian test fair. It was the most exciting moment of his life. But what he did next was most intriguing. Rather than hand them over to the auction, he took them home. One by one, he studied each pair, each shoe, examining them carefully, looking at the numbers stamped on the creamy kid leather lining. He looked at the writing in each, and he determined which were which, which were used for the dance numbers, which used in medium and long shot, which were used for the close-ups, which were used by the stand-in. This mattered to Kent Warner and to history. He also found something remarkable. Two pairs, one well-worn, the other in perfect condition, appeared to be cross-matched in size and stock numbers. In fact, the right shoe of one pair matched the left of the other, and vice versa. Because the shoes were slightly different in size, one 5C, the other 5BC, this discovery meant one of two things. One, that Judy Garland had one foot bigger than the other. But more likely, the pairs were mismatched in the sequining process. This was a classic example of how Hollywood worked, often haphazardly. Most important to Warner were the close-up or insert shoes, the take-me-home-to-Kansas shoes, the witches' shoes. These he would keep for himself. Altogether, the trove of ruby slippers were an incredible find. Only a couple of people knew Kent Warner had them, fellow costumers working the auction, but even they were not privy to the details. The ruby slippers were his secret, his delicious secret. Kent Warner enjoyed letting people assume what they wanted to assume. 
When he delivered a pair of size 5C ruby slippers to MGM's liquidators, he said, look what I found, the ruby slippers, nothing more. He let the auctioneer and everyone else assume they were the one and only pair. What's more, they were the runts of the litter, in terrible shape, definitely well-worn by someone, either Judy Garland, her stand-in, or both. When they sold for $15,000, Kent Warner was thrilled. His effort to save these historic treasures was ratified. Then came news of a pair of ruby slippers in Memphis, Tennessee, Roberta Bauman's size 6B ruby slippers. Kent Warner had to laugh. He was the only person in the world who knew the whole truth of the ruby slippers. He knew how many pairs existed, and he personally owned the best. Kent Warner reveled in his secret and the power he suddenly possessed. When he told people he planned to sell some of the slippers, the genius of the MGM auction became everyone's best friend. Warner always hoped the costumes he saved from destruction would be preserved by people who cherished Hollywood history, people like Debbie Reynolds. He knew the things that were so wonderful and so memorabilia, so in our minds that he would knew everyone would want to preserve and he knew he could trust me to do that. So he sent over these slippers to me and they never came up for auction. He simply brought them home, I suppose. He's since gone, so I can say that. He also brought home an original pair of the other style of the ruby red slippers and that he sold to a man named Michael Shaw. They are the originals and they are really Judy's because I tried them on. And be that they fit me, I knew they were really Judy's. Debbie Reynolds bought the Arabian test pair from Kent Warner for an undisclosed sum of money. Michael Shaw paid $2,500 for his, a bargain. Warner always believed the pair he kept for himself were the most valuable. They were the close-up shoes without the orange felt, the witch's shoes. For many years, he cherished them. But then he noticed that people were paying more attention to his ruby slippers than to him. Their power consumed his identity. Quite sadly, he realized the charm of the ruby slippers was fickle, and if abused, their power was wicked. In 1980, Kent Warner decided to sell his valuable ruby slippers. He told a friend, they don't have the same meaning to me anymore. Warner placed them in a memorabilia auction in Los Angeles. He thought they would bring as much as $75,000, maybe more. But prudently, he set a $20,000 minimum. They didn't sell. Warner was furious. They were a steal at $20,000, and nobody knew it. The next year, he consigned them to Christie's East in New York. They fetched a modest $12,600. Two years later, on April 25th, 1984, Kent Warner died of complications caused by the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. He was 41 years old. Treasure will continue in a moment here on A&E. We now return to Treasure here on A&E. If ever there was a real-life Dorothy, she is Roberta Bauman. Yes, I've been called that a lot of times, but that's a happy thing. I, I don't mind it. As with Dorothy, the ruby slippers were never a quest for Roberta. She just happened to find them on her feet. Well, let's just say, out of the blue, I received something that became magic. And there is a lot of magic to the ruby slippers because it's provided a lot of joy to millions of little kids. As with Dorothy, the ruby slippers took Roberta on an incredible journey. She met a lot of interesting people along the way. A few not so nice, like Dorothy's Wicked Witch of the West, but most, like the Lion, Tin Man, and Scarecrow, 
became her true friend. Roberta Bauman never got an answer from MGM, but she did find out to her satisfaction that she owned an authentic pair of ruby slippers. Well, she actually did have a real pair. And I believe she sold them. In 1988, Roberta decided it was time to part with her treasure, just as Dorothy decided it was time to go home to Kansas. For 48 years, the shoes worked their charm for Roberta. As she parted with them, they had one more surprise for her. They demonstrated their true power. Despite many private offers, Roberta chose to auction her pair of ruby red slippers at Christie's East in New York City, largely because of their reputation and their collectible specialists. Her name was Julie Collier, and she had some experience with the ruby slippers. In 1981, she handled the sale of Kent Warner's pair. For that auction, she did extensive research and learned much about their mystery. By 1988, her expertise was eclipsed only by her excitement to represent another pair of ruby slippers. On Wednesday, March 9th, Roberta Bauman held her ruby slippers for the last time. That day, she shipped them to Julie Collier at Christie's. The auction catalog reflected Collier's enthusiasm. The shoes were exquisitely pictured, described, and diagrammed. Today, that catalog is worth several hundred dollars. Quite modestly, the auction minimum was reserved at $15,000. So, how much are you going to get for these things? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, our estimate is fifteen dollars to $20,000, and we, from all the interest we've been getting so far, I have a feeling they're going to go quite a bit higher than that. People came into the house to interview me. Uh, they said, well, Roberta, those shoes are going to bring six figures. Well, what are you talking about, six figures? And then they'd enumerate. I still had no idea. I had no earthly idea. But I heard there were 15 bids for $75,000. And one of them was Ted Turner. Another hopeful was Anthony Landini. When this lifelong Judy Garland fan learned that a pair of ruby slippers were for sale, he had to see them. So he went to Christie's auction preview. Something happened to me that day. I just stood by that case. I started to perspire. Uh, uh, just a, thrill, a shrill went up my body, and I knew that at that moment, I knew that I had to own the ruby slippers. The auction began at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, June 21st, 1988. The auctioneer said, lot number 125, the ruby slippers from the Wizard of Oz. And uh, the place went into a frenzy. 20 pounds, 22. In two minutes, the bidding had gone up to $75,000. I picked up my paddle at $80,000. It went to 85, it went to 90, it went to $100,000. And there was a very adamant young man sitting in the first row who was bidding with me. So it went to 120, he went 125, I went 130, he went 135, I went 140, he went 145. And I stopped, and I thought, and I just heard the auctioneer say, 145. It's only money. And I shot my paddle up, $150,000. At that price, Landini won the bidding. Roberta Bauman did not attend the auction. Instead, she stayed home in Memphis and waited for the call. I felt good about it. I could almost feel when the uh, auction was going on. And, uh, this, and I was happy, I was calm, and the telephone rang, and it was Julie Collier. She said, are you all right? Are you sitting down? And I said, yes, I'm fine. She said, Roberta, the ruby slippers sold. I said, oh, thank God. She said, that was the most electrifying um, auction that we have ever had. She said they went for $150,000.
With Christie's commission, the final price was $165,000, a world record for Hollywood memorabilia. Just as the Ruby Slippers carried Dorothy home to Kansas, they carried Roberta into retirement. As for the slippers, since dubbed Dorothy's Shoes, their new owner had an idea. He called me and he asked me, he said, what would you think if uh, we was to put those shoes in uh, a new theme park that Walt Disney is building in Orlando, Florida? I said, sir, they're your shoes. I said, that would be a wonderful idea. I could have put them in my living room. I could have kept them locked up in a bank vault, but that would not give me any pleasure, and that would not fulfill my desire of owning the ruby slippers, which is to preserve the magic and show them to the world, to the children. So I contacted Disney MGM Studios theme park, which was just being built at the time, and their answer was, how soon can you get here? Several days after the sale of Roberta Bauman's ruby slippers, something remarkable happened. Kent Warner's prized pair of shoes, the witch's shoes, were consigned once again to Christie's. Rather than promote another public auction, Christie's arranged a private sale at the same price, $165,000. They were purchased by a collector in St. Louis named Philip Samuels. When I was told the shoes were available and they would be the same price as the pair sold at Christie's, uh, and the condition, from what I could tell, was better than the pair that was sold, uh, I, I bought them immediately. Once again, Julie Collier handled the sale. But tragically, it was the last time she touched a pair of ruby slippers. In January 1989, she was killed on the streets of New York, hit by a truck while riding her bicycle to work. Today, five pairs of ruby slippers are known to exist. The first and most distinct pair are the Arabian test shoes. They were not used in the movie, but nonetheless are extremely valuable. They were found by Kent Warner and are owned by Debbie Reynolds. The Smithsonian shoes, size 5C, were originally purchased at the MGM auction in 1970 by an anonymous buyer who donated them to the museum in 1979. They remain on perpetual display. They are in poor condition, probably worn by Judy Garland and her stand-in during production. Roberta Bauman's size 6B shoes, Dorothy's shoes as they are known, are owned by Anthony Landini. They are currently displayed at the Walt Disney MGM Studio theme park in Orlando, Florida. They are in fair condition, probably used in the dance scene. But they are unique because they are the only pair that Kent Warner never touched. Their provenance is pure. The fourth known pair belonged to Michael Shaw of Los Angeles. He declined to be interviewed for this program. Shaw purchased them from Kent Warner. These are the pair that cross-match with the Smithsonian shoes. They're in pristine condition, size 5C, with the name Judy Garland written on the lining. Because of their value, he rarely displays them for the public. I have to keep the shoes uh, in a bank vault. Uh, the people that still own things that I know they own are in their closets at home, I beg them, really. Let the public see them and have them. It's many years. You shouldn't keep them to yourself. The last and most intriguing pair of ruby slippers are the witch's shoes, size 5B. Without question, these were the close-up shoes the pair Kent Warner cherished. They are in excellent condition. Number 7, Judy Garland, is written on the lining. Today, they belong to Philip Samuels of St. Louis, Missouri. On two occasions, he has loaned them to the Smithsonian Institution for display, while the Smithsonian pair were on a national tour. There may well be another pair out there, but nobody knows for sure, except Kent Warner, and he is gone. 
Ultimately, Warner's legacy is that he found and preserved the ruby slippers and put them in the hands of people who cared. I happen to be passionate about gray films, and I hope that I can, and I have, saved a lot of that history, and I'm very proud of that and happy that I could do it. One fact is certain. It is almost impossible to keep the ruby slippers hidden from the public. Their charm and their power draw people to them. Indeed, they are magic. All you have to do is believe.